This video will discuss some of the misunderstandings that exist when trying to talk about the scientific method. I'd be willing to bet that you've learned about the scientific method for a really, really long time. In fact, the steps that you see here on the screen are probably very well known to you. You know that scientists begin by asking a question or identifying a problem that they're interested in. They go out, they make observations, they gather information, they do that background research that is required to learn more about the problem or the question that they plan to investigate further. The next step, of course, is to write that hypothesis. More on writing hypotheses later. For now, it's important to note that all hypotheses must be testable with an experiment. We know that scientists then go ahead and design and conduct their experiments. You will have multiple opportunities throughout the year to both design and conduct your own experiments. Not experiments that you look up in a book, not experiments that you follow like a recipe, but experiments that you design on your own. During that process, you of course will collect results, and of course you'll also make conclusions. But the scientific method does not stop there. I want you to note that arrow right there. This arrow shows us that even at the end of an experiment, even after results are collected and conclusions are made, scientists must go back and look at their hypothesis and ask themselves a very simple question. Does the data that was collected during the experiment support the hypothesis? This is not a question of whether or not your data are right or wrong. Oftentimes, scientists don't know the answer to their questions, thus they can't be right or wrong. And it's also not a question of proving their hypothesis with their data, okay? We'll talk later on about how one can disprove hypotheses in science, but for now, make a note that you can't prove a hypothesis. You can only support it or refute it with the results that you collect during the experiment. So what does it take to write a good hypothesis? Well, I bet you've seen the definition of a hypothesis in other science classes as a prediction, or maybe even an educated guess. But let's be really clear. There's no guessing in science. Scientists who guess are unemployed scientists. Scientists make predictions. In fact, they often make predictions where they know, or at least reasonably can expect, uh, what's going to happen during, during an experiment. So, in our class, what's going to make a good hypothesis? Well, you're going to have your prediction. That's still going to be an important part of the puzzle. But we're going to go a little bit further. Along with that prediction, we're also going to have an explanation. And this explanation is going to be used to explain, not surprisingly, why something should happen during the experiment. So good hypotheses have two parts. They have predictions and they have explanations. Down below, I've included some examples of good scientific hypotheses. Let's see if we can find the prediction and the explanation in them, or in, in, in each one of them. So in the first one I've written, the presence of Corexa in the Gulf ecosystem will decrease reproductive success in successive years because microscopic oil droplets can interfere with the development of embryos in ovo or in utero. Can you find the prediction? Take a second and reread the hypothesis to make sure that you can. Pause the video if you need to. So, I think the prediction is this first statement. It's a prediction of what you think is going to happen in the experiment. Is there an explanation? Sure. The explanation is that second statement that follows the because. For right now, it's not important that you know what in ovo means or in utero means. If you do know what they mean, great. In fact, it doesn't even matter if you understand what corrects it is or how it works. For right now, we're just focusing on determining if a hypothesis is good or not. If it has a prediction and it has an explanation, you can consider the hypothesis to be pretty good. There are some other examples here that you can take a look at, but let's scroll down to number two. Hypotheses must be testable with a scientific experiment. Down below, I've just included some statements that hopefully allow you to visualize how that hypothesis could be tested with an experiment. So, fertilized fish eggs maintained in the laboratory will be exposed to different concentrations of corexit, and the presence of a developmental abnormality will be assessed. Obviously, this is nowhere near what will be required in the procedure for your experiment. It just gives you an opportunity to see how a scientist might test the hypothesis as it was written above. There might be a different experiment that goes along with that hypothesis. That's fine. This is just an example. In fact, I would encourage you to see if you can come up with your own example. Do some research on corexit. 
do some research on what it does and what it is, and see if you can write your own hypothesis for how Corexit may affect developing embryos. So how do you write good hypotheses? Well, I'd be willing to bet that you've seen the if-then statement for hypothesis writing in other classes. If I do this, then this will happen. Well, just make note, this is the prediction, okay? It's not a good hypothesis yet, it's missing the explanation part, but notice what I've done is just created a very simple linking word, because. Because immediately precedes the explanation. So, together, an if-then-because statement can be used to write a good hypothesis. If I do this, then this will happen because of that. Okay? Really simple. If you don't want to use the if-then-because format, you don't have to. Just make sure that your hypothesis has a prediction and an explanation. We'll practice a lot of this in class over the next couple days and really over the course of the entire year. So once you have hypotheses down, it's important to move on to the next part of understanding the scientific method. You know what variables are. You know that variables are conditions that can change during an experiment. And you know that there are three types of variables to consider when planning a scientific experiment. There's your independent variable, there's your dependent variable, and there are your constant variables, variable and quotation marks, as you can see. You know that the independent variable is a variable that you change or you manipulate during the experiment. In fact, your textbook refers to the independent variable as the manipulated variable. The dependent variable, or the responding variable, according to your book, is a condition that is being measured during an experiment. Okay? It's going to respond to changes in the independent variable. And as you can see down below, a change to the dependent variable depends, hint, hint, on a change to the independent variable. All right, great, pretty simple. You've had that, you've had that now for several years in science class. What about these constant variables? I'd be willing to bet that you've heard constants referred to as controlled variables. Well, wait a minute. If a constant is a controlled variable, then what's a control? It's almost um, immediately confusing for students if you don't know the difference between a constant and a control. For this class, and really for all science classes, constants are conditions that are kept the same during an experiment. They don't change, okay? Controls are different, and we'll get into those in a minute. But if you can, in the back of your mind, can think of a constant as something that doesn't change, and a control is something different than a constant, you're going to be in really good shape. So what is the difference between... So then, what is the difference between a constant and a control? Remember, constants are conditions that are kept the same. Controls are not the same as constants. You've learned that controls are experimental setups in which the effect of the independent variable is not included or not tested. And while that's fine for, a, for an elementary school or a middle school science experiment, we need to go a step further. For biologists, we're often going to encounter two different types of controls, positive controls and negative controls. Positive controls are setups where there is a change in the dependent variable. You observe that change in the dependent variable, and that change is expected. So, for example, with the Corexit hypothesis that we saw before, if you expose the fertilized fish eggs to very high concentrations of Corexit, you would have expected those embryos to exhibit developmental abnormalities. In other words, the independent variable is expected to have an effect. This is different from what you have seen as a control in the past. In the past, you've seen controls as actually something a little bit different. What you've seen controls as are actually the negative control. Okay. Notice the definition of the, ex of the negative control is a setup in which a change in the dependent variable is not observed or measured according to expectations. So this time, you set up your experiment in such a way where you do not expect there to be a change in the dependent variable. Thus, the independent variable is not expected to have an effect. Let's think about this for a second. The control that you've encountered in previous classes is the same as the negative control. Okay? That's fine. What I want you to be aware of is that there are other types of controls that scientists have to work with. 
in this case, the positive control. The positive control is an experimental setup where you expect there to be a change in the dependent variable. In order for there to be a change in the dependent variable, you're going to have to include the independent variable, but probably at a level or a concentration that you would not typically test that particular variable at in the real experiment. Okay? It's going to be either really high or really low. The negative control is different. The negative control lacks the independent variable, just like you'd expect, and when you omit that independent variable, or um, omit the effect of that independent variable, you would not expect there to be a change to the dependent variable. Make sense? Excellent. Okay, so let's try to put some of these ideas together. In your textbook, you read about the Ready experiment. Ready experiment attempted to investigate the source of maggots that appeared on raw meat over the course of time. This idea was in reference to spontaneous generation. Keep in mind that there was a time in the history of science where scientists didn't necessarily know where life came from. In fact, many scientists and the lay public thought that life could have emerged from non-living entities. Okay, so let's take a look at this experiment and first try to write a hypothesis for what you see here on the screen. Take a second and write a hypothesis in your notebook. Pause the video if you need to. So hopefully at this point you've written your hypothesis. Does your hypothesis have two, the two parts that you need? Does it have your prediction and does it have your explanation? Did you use if, then, and because? If you did, great. If you didn't, not a big deal. Again, the goal is to write a hypothesis that has both the prediction and the explanation components. If I were to write a hypothesis, I might have come up with something like, if glass jars containing raw meat are covered, then maggots will not emerge on the raw meat because adult flies do not have access to the meat on which they would lay their eggs, which will eventually hatch and, uh, uh, and create uh, visible maggots. It doesn't matter if your hypothesis matches mine or not. Really, I just came up with that off the top of my head, much like you just did. Okay, let's look at the rest of the slide in a little bit more detail. As you can see here, your book already uses a term which I don't want you to use in this class. And I know this can be confusing, but you just gotta trust me on this one. Scientists don't often refer to controlled variables. And if they do, what they really mean to say are constants. Constants are controlled variables. They're not the same as the control. So I'm hoping at this point, on your notebook, you can make a list of some of the constants that Reddy would have had to keep the same during the experiment. Pause the video and take a few minutes to jot down some of those constants in your notebook. All right, great, you have your constants. Now, your independent variable should be pretty straightforward. What is the independent variable in this experiment? Take a second, jot down your independent variable in your notebook. So what'd you come up with? Did you write down the cover on the glass jar? If you did, I would agree with you. That's most likely the independent variable in this experiment. All right, last but not least, the dependent variable. Take a second and jot down the dependent variable in your notebook. All right, so what'd you use? <laughs> exactly, there may be more than one correct answer here. You could have used the appearance of maggots. You could have used the appearance of adult flies landing on the meat. There's many different possibilities here. There's not one right answer. It all is a question of what you choose to use or what you choose to measure during the experiment. Okay, last but not least, the controls. Remember, controls not the same as constants. What do you think Reddy would have, e would have used as a negative control in his experiment? Well. Think about it for a second. Got it? Ah, the cover jars. I agree with you. If Reddy was trying to test the hypothesis on spontaneous generation by covering the jars and not giving the adult flies access to the raw meat, he would have been able to determine whether or not the raw meat was able to generate the maggots all on its own. In other words, if Reddy were using the appearance of maggots as his dependent variable, and he created an experimental condition, an experimental setup, where no maggots appeared, then he had his negative control. Make sense? 
All right, how about the positive control? This one's going to be a little bit trickier in the case of the ready experiment. Is there an experimental setup that Reddy could have used to guarantee that he would have seen maggots appear on the meat? I'll give you a hint. It's unlikely that the picture that you see here on the slide is going to reveal the answer. So what I'd like you to do is take a minute and think about an experimental setup that Reddy could have set up himself, or if you were ready, that you would have set up to maximize the probability of obtaining a positive control in the experiment. Think about the, what the positive control needs to be. It's an experimental setup where you expect there to be a change in the dependent variable. Okay, so that's it for now. We'll talk more about variables and controls in class. We'll be using them throughout the year, so if you don't feel like you're a master at this point, don't freak out. Over the course of the year, your goal is to understand biology better than you did at the beginning of the year. If you have questions, please come and talk to me before class or after class, during ACLAB, whatever works best for you. You can even shoot me an email if you got a quick question after you watch the video. All right, that ends this video for now. I look forward to seeing you in class tomorrow.